Good morning and welcome. Thank you. It's good to it's good to be together this weekend. It's really my privilege to spend some time with you. We're talking about this series called Gains. What does it mean to work out our faith? And today I hope they can get really practical with you and some real tangible takeaways with that. The idea of working out, that's kind of been our theme for the last couple of weeks. And it leads me to ask the question, like, why do people work out? Like, like, why do they even bother doing it in the first place? And so there need to be some kind of goals in mind, some objectives for that. I have some friends who are bodybuilders, and they are learning how to literally put, like, muscle upon muscle upon muscle. Um, I watch them do that, in case you were wondering. I, I, I just watch them do that. Um, but, but it's pretty amazing to see them. And, and literally, you can see definition of muscles. I didn't even know we had in the human body, but they are able to, to develop them and to show them. they got some very specific objectives, why they're doing what they're doing. There's also a group of people that I'm around as part of the fire service who are participating um, in CrossFit training. And just so you know that, I don't do that either. All right? so, but, but CrossFit is designed around what would be called functional fitness, like, like training that makes a difference for you like day to day. So bodybuilding is for this great purpose. You're building this physique. There are competitions to go to. But functional fitness, like CrossFit, is designed for very practical movements that you can use every day on a regular basis. That's what I'm talking Hold at least. But my thought is, what would it look like if we approached our faith from a functional faith perspective? So, so, so why do you develop your faith? Why, why, do, why do you grow in your faith? For some people, they're amassing some, some Bible skills and knowledge. Maybe they're pursuing some, some intellectual theological thoughts. But I believe what we have the opportunity to do is to develop a functional faith, a faith that would make a difference like every day of life, a faith that would give me insight and wisdom and skills and knowledge and understanding that would make a difference day to day. And that's really what I want to talk with us about today. What would it look like for you and I to invest in exercises of faith, but that have a purpose to that? And I, I'm going to sum up what I'm looking for this morning in two simple phrases. Here's the first phrase. I believe our faith works. I believe our faith makes a difference. I believe, as I've been a follower of Jesus for over 40 years, that our faith makes a difference. It makes a difference in my marriage, in my parenting, in my finances. It makes a difference as I'm out of my community serving. It makes a difference in what I believe about my future, about where I can find peace and comfort in the midst of struggle. I absolutely believe our faith works. But secondly, I also believe that our faith takes work. That our faith is something we have to stay engaged with. It didn't just like happen all of a sudden one day. Our, our salvation happens all of a sudden one day. But that our faith needs to continue to be worked on, if you will. And so this notion of functional faith allows me to say, I want to invest in growing and learning and changing so that the faith I have available to me every day can make a difference no matter what life has going on. Paul, Paul wrote about it maybe this way. can kind of capture this thought in one simple verse. He was writing to Timothy and he said this, Physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better, promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. So what would it be like for you and I to develop some, some physical fitness skills, but apply them in very spiritual ways? What would it be like to develop a functional faith? So we're going to look in the book of Hebrews, the 10th chapter. There's four verses that I want to find four points out of that will allow me to know how to better develop this very practical faith, a faith that works, knowing that it's a faith that takes some work as well. But to do that, let me give you a real quick background of um, Hebrews chapter 10. So the Jew would have grown up in a system of having to make sacrifices all the time, every day because of the sin in the people's lives. And it was always known that none of these sacrifices are really ever good enough, which is why we'll see it tomorrow because we need to do some more sacrificing. And so that became the whole culture of the Jewish religion was all these sacrifices to appease God because of their disobedience. Well, when Jesus comes on the scene, the scriptures make it very clear that he comes as the perfect sacrifice. Often you will see him referred to as the Lamb of God. This, this picture of the sacrifice would have been very clear in the mind of the Jew. But no longer would Jesus Jesus had to be continually sacrificed because he was the perfect sacrifice. And because of that then, it changes everything about my life going forward. So in Hebrews 10, verse 10, we first understand what God was accomplishing through Jesus' perfect sacrifice. It says, for God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. That that one sacrifice of Jesus, the one time that he was willing and able to give up his life, what that resulted in for you and for me is that we would be made holy. 
that we would become perfect, that we would be seen as, as clean and blameless before God. And that's something God accomplished when Jesus died on the cross. And for those who have a faith in Jesus, who believe him as their Lord and Savior, we have that given to us, that, that sense of being holy and blameless without fault, without blemish, set apart and purified. God has already done that. And yet, every morning I wake up and realize there's still some ways for me to go. Right? There's, there's a tension between what has already been done and, and what hasn't yet been fully accomplished. That my faith works because of what Jesus did on the cross, but I still have a faith I have to work on. So what does that tension look like? How do you live out in the meantime as God is doing his work in you? How do you live and gain this idea of a functional fitness? Paul, in one verse, and it's a verse you're familiar with, but it shows the now and the not yet part of what our faith is. Paul writes this. I'm certain that God, who began the good work within you, he had already done this. However, he will continue his work until it's finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. There's a now part to our faith. It's what God's already accomplished through the cross. He sees you today, now, complete and fully being clean, being holy, being set apart. And yet, there is still a not yet part to our faith. And that's what I want us to learn how to better develop what is it like to have a functional faith that continues to grow and nurture and develop so that my faith can make a difference every day along the way? In Hebrews 10, there's four verses I want us to look at. And in each one of those verses, I want us to glean a point of how do I continue the journey of growing in my faith, of truly working out my faith. Here's the first thing. Trust God. Trust God. Now, if you're astute, you probably could have written trust God down in your notes before I said it. You probably could write trust God down in your notes every week we get together because that's the very foundation of our faith that we, we learn to trust God in all that we do. And yet in a very clear way in the context of Hebrews 10, the writer helps me to realize that I can trust God, why I can trust him and the difference that it makes along the way. Have you ever met a celebrity? Have you ever been around a celebrity? Have you ever seen a celebrity, whether it's a, a sports figure or a music star, or maybe a news personality? Have you, ever, have you ever seen someone out in public? And, and let me ask you this, did you have access to them? Were you able to just go right up to them and say, hey, my name is so-and-so, oh, Shaquille O'Neal, very nice to meet you. Probably not. <laughs> Because there are probably some barriers in the way. There was probably some protection, maybe some bodyguards. There was some distance. You didn't get full access. And what the writer of Hebrews helps us to see is that when our relationship with God, because of what Jesus has done, we have full access to God. Listen to what we read. This is in Hebrews 10, verse 22. Let us go right into the presence of God. I, I want you to consider that maybe just for a moment that you and I have been given an invitation into the very presence of God, like anytime we want to go. That because of what Jesus said on the cross, the barriers have all been removed and we have full access to God. God sees us as complete and mature and holy and perfect. And because of that, I get to come right into his presence every time. To me, that's profound. And I, and I, and I, and I pray that I never, and I pray you never lose the sense of awe of what that actually means that we get to go whenever we choose directly into the very presence of God. The holy, sovereign God of the universe says, hey, come on over. The, the, the one who created all things by just the words of his mouth invites us into this close relationship. I, I, I hope and pray that every time you bow your head to pray, that, that every time you open the scriptures to read, you are overwhelmed at the presence of God in your life that you realize the privilege that Jesus has given us, that at any moment in time, we can come right into the presence of God. That's, that's profound. I hope you never, ever, I hope I never, ever get over that. So the writer of Hebrews says this, let's go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. How do I get to do that? It continues on. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, I can stand in God's presence. The barriers have all been removed. I have complete access. Not like some celebrity who's got a bodyguard, somebody else I kind of got to go through, not some password I have to have on the side. I get the privilege of coming right into the very presence of God. And as I get to do that, I realize how he sees me. He sees me. He sees you, those of us that are in Christ, through the lens of Jesus. 
And that's how we can say that we are seen as those who are holy, who are blameless, who are spotless. I don't know if you ever considered that that's how God sees you. When he looks out at his children, he doesn't see all the flaws and the frailty of our lives. He sees the work that Jesus has done in you to complete the work that God has set him to do in the first place. Paul writes about this in Colossians 1. Listen to the beautiful language of how we are described. Yet now he has, God has reconciled you to himself. He's brought us together through the death of Christ in his physical body. And listen here now. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. That's profound. And I pray that deep in your heart, that gives you some sense of, of your worth and your value and that God loves you so much that he's done that work in you because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And yet, there's still this tension that I'm not there yet. God may see me that way. I don't always see myself that way. The world doesn't always certainly see me that way. But because of that, I can learn to trust God with my struggles, with my shortcomings, with my difficulties, with my joy, with my hope, with my future. I can trust God. He loves me so much, he allowed his son to die on my behalf. And the completed work of Jesus means I am clean and holy and blameless before him. That's amazing. And I pray deep in your spirit that that means something strong to you. Well, there's a second thing that we see as this passage continues in Hebrews 10, and it's the need for us to stay steady in this journey of life. In, in, this, in developing this functional fitness, part of what I need to do is be steady, to be consistent, to be deliberate, to be intentional with my growth. Now, I know there's no doubt about it. Salvation is a free gift. It's given to us. It's because of what Jesus did. It's got nothing to do with ourselves. But there's also this sense that I have got this, this work to do with my salvation, Remember, I believe our faith works, but also that our faith takes work. And that was one of the very first verses that Pastor Ron mentioned when we started the series, as Paul said, you are to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Not to get saved, that's the gift. But because we are saved, because we do know Jesus now, I want to be one who's working out that salvation. That's the, that's the not yet part of this tension. There's all this that God's already done, the way he already sees us, and yet there's this not yet part. It's still in works. Philippians 3, Paul wrote this. I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. Have you ever wondered if you could like kind of make it as a follower of Jesus? Have you ever wondered if you have what it takes, if you will, to continue the journey? That, 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 you, that you'll be consistent in the way in which you're living. And that's what the writer of Hebrews calls us to next. He says, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope that we affirm. For God can be trusted, and there's the trust thing again, to keep his promise. Let us hold tightly without wavering. Let's not be people who are double-minded, who go back and forth, who believe one day and, and, and don't believe the next, who are unfaithful and inconsistent and don't live kind of down this beautiful path that God's laid before us. Have you ever been in the car with someone who was wavering, who wasn't consistent with their driving, who maybe was kind of veering a little bit from side to side, maybe they were distracted by the coffee or the phone, and as they were driving, maybe you're getting a little more nervous, and all of a sudden you heard, ba-dum, 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 ba-dum. Yeah, right, those rumble strips, and all of a sudden the person's like, oh, okay. See, those rumble subs, kind of, they got us back on course, didn't they? They got us back on direction. They said, hey, wait a second, you're veering off to the side. We need you to come back on the course. That's, that's the idea. We want to live in a manner that we're living consistently. We're living faithfully. There's some of these, these rumble strips that God's placed along the way to help us. Some of those rumble strips are found within what we call the spiritual disciplines. The time that we spend reading God's word. As I know more and more about who he is and what he has for my life, they, they provide some rumble strips for me to understand of how I should be living. Why well, spend time praying and opening my heart up to the God who says, come right into my presence. Trust me, come in with all of your challenges. They provide some, some direction for me. Why we gather together weekly, why we gather together and serve, why we gather together with others, those are all part of the idea of having some rumble strips along the way. But one of the challenges with the spiritual disciplines is that they can be hard to sustain 
And oftentimes I think because we don't have a good perspective of what they're there for. Let me give you an example. So at 6.30 every morning, my alarm goes off. 6.30 a.m. Every morning, my alarm goes off. Three days a week at 6.31, I begin this internal conversation of why I should or should not get up and actually go running. <laughs> it's, it's a, if, you, if you're there, you get it. It's an internal conversation that goes on probably for five or ten minutes. And I'll, I generally do a pretty good job, and I'll get up and get going. The conversation continues as I'm getting dressed, as I'm walking out of the house, as I'm running my first half mile. That conversation. But, but here's what I've learned. Here's what I know. I don't run to run. Running, running is not like the objective. That's not the goal. For me, running is so I can stay on course of being well, of staying healthy. Running is not the end game. Running is one of the things that gets me toward that end game. And I think that's what the spiritual disciplines provide for us. There are times I know that you enter time in reading the scriptures and, and you're not sure like, like, like why or I didn't get it today or what does that mean or do I even want to? The goal, hear this, the goal is not to read the Bible. The goal is through reading the Bible, I learn more about God. I learn more about his plan for the world, his plan for my life. I, I do that through the Bible. If you think the goal is the Bible, at some point in time, you say, I don't know if I want to keep doing this. So how do we learn to, to see God has given us some of these rumble strips, if you will, some, some guardrails that we can use to make sure we're living this consistent life, that we're being steady, that we're not wavering and kind of going back and forth along the way. We can trust God to do his part. That's where we started. Trust God because of what he's already accomplished in Jesus. And the way in which he sees you now is this completed, perfect person that he loves and created just the way you are. But there's also the not yet part. There's this, there's this tension and there's this working out of our salvation. And part of that has to do with us faithfully keeping on the journey day in and day out. Trusting God, staying steady. Those are challenging. I'm, I'm not suggesting this is easy. It's difficult. It's especially difficult if you're trying to do it by yourself, if you're alone in these pursuits and these desires. And so the next two verses I want to share from Hebrews 10 begins to talk about the need to bring others into this journey that ultimately, just like working out the gym is better with others, so is working out our faith and that functional fitness is best done in the life with others. And so the third thing, and we find this in the next verse in Hebrews 10, is the need to motivate others, to be engaged with one another and to provide some motivation. Hebrews 10, 24 says, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Let, let us think of ways to motivate one another. How can I motivate you? How can you motivate me as we're on this journey of life? We're trusting God, we're trying to live this steady life, not wavering. And I realize now I need other people to help me. And while God, God has given me some of those, those uh, rumble strips through the word and through prayer, he's also done that through the lives of people that are around us. In the summer of 1982, I did a mission trip. I was a new believer. I had become a follower of Jesus my freshman year of college. And this was now between my junior and senior year of college that I went on a mission trip. It was an organization called Campus Crusade for Christ. They're now called CRU. And they're involved in college campuses all around the country. And my new faith was now going to be kind of taken to the next level by being on a mission trip for the whole summer. We were going to go to Virginia Beach, Virginia, and, and share the gospel and talk about our faith and, and encourage people to become followers of Jesus, to strengthen the churches that were there in the community, and to, to let this be a time not only that I would grow, but that I would serve and give my life away. Our normal routine was that we, as all college students, poor college students, we had to work, so we had some income to go back to school with. So we worked a job in the morning, probably from six to two maybe, and then we spent the afternoons and the evening engaging with the community. Oftentimes what the afternoons were was about playing beach volleyball, kind of gathering a crowd, and then during a break between games, sharing the gospel, telling the people about the faith that we have found in Jesus. And it was an amazing opportunity for me to grow in my personal faith but what I realized pretty quickly is that I needed those other students that were with me on this mission trip to help me stay the course, to help me keep on the journey. That there need to be others around me to motivate me toward love and good works because on my own, I, I may have had some challenges. So, so if you can picture um, a group of probably about 40 college students, 20 of them men, 20 of them women, and these 20 college age men, we're all probably about 19, 20, 21 years old, out on the beach in Virginia, 
spending time playing volleyball with members of the opposite sex and being challenged to live a faithful life for Jesus in the midst of that. College boys, college girls, maybe not the most wholesome environments, and we needed to be careful. Paul writes in the word, he says, to flee immorality. And so the code word that we had for one another when things were getting maybe a little more tempting than they should was this, run away, <laughs> run away. Paul said to flee immorality, run away. We needed to learn how to avert our eyes, how to be gentlemen, how to be wholesome, because we were trying to follow Jesus, but we were doing this in a pretty, pretty kind of a, a worldly environment, if you will. But what I realized, if I was trying to do that by myself and nobody was calling me and telling me to run away, it'd be that much more difficult. That would continue, that, that pattern of others motivating and encouraging and challenging me would continue. As I got involved after college in smaller churches, there were some kind of very natural connections and intimacy that developed. Getting involved in a large church like the Springsman, I had to be more intentional at it. But every step along the way, what I realized is that if I was going to try to do this on my own, I was kind of setting myself up for failure. That I needed to be motivated and challenged by others, and I needed to do the same for them along the way. There's a, another translation where it says not to motivate one another, but to spur on one another to love and good deeds. That spurring, that prodding, that pushing is what can really make a difference in your life and the lives of the people that are around you. You know, one of our values as a church is that we grow larger and smaller at the same time. Larger is happening down in the villages in Middleton. Larger is our opportunity to take the, what, what God has blessed us with all these years here in Ocala and engage and connect with another group of people geographically and generationally in this, this family community in Middleton. There are 8,000 homes going up in this community and we're gonna have a church right in the middle of that. That's an opportunity that's, that's unbelievable for us to grow larger. And yet we realize the need we have in our own lives is that we grow smaller that we connect closer and closer to other people that we can be on this journey of life together with. And that's what, that's what this season of getting ready to do groups is really all about, is our opportunity to come alongside of people who have the same goals and desires to make a difference as we're moving forward along the way. We need to be connected to others in order to be able to truly trust God and to follow him to stay kind of on track with what we're trying to do. But I won't, I, I won't, I won't make it seem like it's easy because it's not. Doing life with other people is hard. People are messy. I'm messy, you're messy. And bringing lives together can be filled with challenges. It's hard to find the time to do that because we're all busy. It's hard to be open with one another and there's some degree of intimacy is needed, some degree of vulnerability is needed for a group to really connect. It can be hard to do that. It can be hard to make it a priority. But I can tell you when I look back over my Christian journey, that the seasons that were always filled with the most significance, the most growth, the most peace even, were times I was connecting with others and we were walking alongside of each other through life. One of the greatest seasons we ever had, and, and sadly, I have to think back years and years ago, that's just the way life has happened. When we were with a group and we spent a lot of time together, we went to church together, we served in a ministry together, we connected around scripture together, we went out socially together. We probably were together four or probably three or four times a week. And it made all the difference because these were people that we were well connected with then. And during the joys and the struggles of life, we were together through those. In times that we needed to be motivated and encouraged, there were people that were there for us as well. It's hard. I'm not, I'm not trying to suggest that this is easy. But I'm telling you, if you're willing to invest yourself in it, it's absolutely worth it. And what we're encouraging you to do in this next season is for these five weeks is just get connected. Get connected with a group of people around a table here. Let it just begin there and let's see what God wants to do with that. Some of the most uh, personal, close relationships you may ever develop in your life could just be one gathering away. We would encourage you to walk toward that. There's one more thing that um, the scripture speaks about, and it's the need for us to stay connected then, to stay connected with others. It's interesting, there's this tendency, and sadly we all have it, to drift away from each other, to drift toward isolation. But when we find ourselves isolated, we also find ourselves very vulnerable. I think about seasons maybe in your life or seasons in my life where maybe we didn't make the best decision, maybe we were um, in a compromising situation and we, we fell victim to that. And I wonder what it would have been like for you or even for me if we had those people around us during those seasons. Would they have been able to be some of those rumble strips that we need in our lives? And that's what really what the scriptures are talking about. You see, I know that if I would have been in Virginia Beach that summer by myself, the story could have ended very, very differently. 
I needed this group of guys around me. But, but not just any guys. I needed guys who were on the same journey that I was on that had the same desire to honor Christ, that had the same passion to follow after him. Together then, we were able to accomplish some pretty incredible things. And so the writer of Hebrews says this in the last verse we're going to look at this morning, verse 25. Let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. 2,000 years ago, the church had to be told, hey, keep getting together together. Don't, don't, don't stop. Don't, don't neglect this. This is too important. You don't want to be alone. You don't want to be isolated because that's where difficulties can come along the way. That's where you can lose your way along the journey. And the fire service we've been developing over the last many years, what we call peer support teams. And real simply, peer support suggests that there's nobody better than a firefighter to get a firefighter. There's nobody better to understand the joys and the struggles and the accomplishments and the defeats. There's nobody better than a firefighter to get what another firefighter is going through. So we train firefighters on how to be better listeners and how to have some basic mental health skills so they can guide people and help them deal with stress, et cetera, et cetera. But we know that a firefighter most likely is only going to be willing to talk to another firefighter because other people don't get it. It's a very different world. I think the same can be said true for what we have as a goal and a desire in doing life with one another within the body of Christ. You, if you're following Jesus, you have a different set of goals. You have a different set of, ob, uh, of, of standards, a different objective in mind. You're living life differently. And, and there are people around your life who just don't have that same drive, that same mission, that same desire. It doesn't mean they're bad people. I'm not suggesting you totally hive off. What I'm suggesting is that there are people that you need to have around you, that I need to have around me, that have got this commonality of goal, this commonality of purpose. It wasn't any group of guys over the summer for me. It was this group of guys that we were going to do life together with all along the way. So what would that look like for you to be willing to do that? To be willing to say, I'm going to go against everything I have and get into that. I am a classic introvert. And you don't know that because this is what you see. But I'm a classic introvert. And the idea of getting around a table with a group of people I might not know, that's not what I consider as time of it that's exciting. For some of you, it's like, new people, that's amazing. I can't wait to meet my new friends. That's not me. And it's probably not some of you. How, how many of you would say you're introverts? <laughs> you wouldn't raise your hands anyway. <laughs> I just had to do that. That's, I didn't even have that in my notes. I just had to do that. But your willingness to come across that and say, hey, I really want to invest. Here's what I know about you. You desire to live a life that's honoring to God. You desire to follow him, heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the reason I know that is because you're here. You could be somewhere else, you're not, you're here. You have a desire to, to know God more and more. You also realize there's a tension in your life and there's in my life between the now, the way God sees us, and the not yet. All those ways that I am not yet the person God made me to be. That's the working out of my salvation. And I know you experience that tension as well. Times of struggle, times of defeat, times of failure. I get, I get that. But I also know that there are times where you feel like you're the only one that's trying to live this kind of life. Maybe the only one in your family because there's no other followers of Jesus in your home. Maybe the only one at the workplace because the people around you certainly don't seem like they're trying to follow Jesus. And you feel alone and isolated in that. And when that happens, you become vulnerable. But if you linked your life with people who had that same passion and drive and desire, your life would be radically different. I, I, I can promise you that. If you're willing to do the hard work, it'll make all the difference. So would you be willing for five weeks to connect with some other people and just, just see, just see what God might want to do with that. If nothing else, you're going to come away five weeks later and you're going to know the names of a few more people in our church, if nothing else. But what if, what if God's got a group of people together for you and they're, you're there for them as well? And that together we'd be able to continue this incredible journey. Now, but not yet, there's this process. There's this working out my salvation with fear and trembling. There's this realizing that my faith works, but my faith also takes work. And that's what we're doing. And together, I believe, we can get some incredible things accomplished. That's a process. But the process started with a moment in time that you said yes to Jesus. That you said yes, and all those things that we talked about at the beginning of the message became true in your life. 
holy and blameless, spotless, pure, righteous in his sight because of Jesus. That's where it began. But for some of you, it hasn't started yet. And so as I spent the last time talking about the process here, this, this sort of doesn't apply to you yet because you haven't started the journey until now. So now is your opportunity. If you've never trusted Jesus as your savior, if you've never started the process, if you've never realized that you can indeed be clean in this sight, not because of who you are, but because of what he's done, this is your opportunity to receive him. Let me pray for us. I want to pray something out loud. This may capture the essence of your heart. You can just pray this quietly. Father, thank you for sending Jesus. The amazing transformation that you make possible because he was willing to die for my sin, I can come away from that by trusting in him, clean, loved, accepted. Jesus, thank you that you were willing to die and that you rose again and now there's this life ahead of me, this, this life of this journey now of working out my faith. And Father, I pray that you would just walk with me every step. Help me stay close to you. I wanna become the person you've made me to be. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.